Christopher Quarles, College Professor and Master Detective by Percy James Brebner The Death Trap in the Tudor Room I had not been to Chelsea for some weeks. Indeed, I had not been in town, business having kept me in the country, and I returned to find a letter from Quarles, which had been waiting for me for three days. Several cases were in my hands just then, affairs of no great difficulty, nor any particular interest, and only in one case had I any worry. This trouble was due not so much to the case itself as to the fact that it had brought me in contact with another detective named Baines, who would persist in treating me as a rival. He was as irritating as Quarles himself could be on occasion, and was entirely without the professor's genius. To be candid, I may admit Baines had some excuse. Circumstances brought me into the affair at the eleventh hour, and he was afraid I should reap where he had planted. It was a strange business from first to last, and one I am never likely to forget. A man, riding across an open piece of country near Aylesbury early one morning, came upon a motorcyclist lying near his machine on the roadside. The machine had been reduced to scrap iron. The man, who was dressed in overalls, seemed to have been killed outright by a blow on the head. Since the man still wore his goggles, and there was no sign of a struggle, Baines argued, and reasonably, I think, that death was not the result of foul play, that he had been run into by a motor car, and that the people in the car had either not stopped to see what damage was done, or, having seen it, feared to give information, was perhaps giving too loose a rein to imagination. However, this was Baines' idea, and he had succeeded in hearing of a car with only one man in it which had been driven through Aylesbury at a furious pace on the night when a second similar tragedy occurred, this time near Saffron Walden. The man had been killed in the same fashion, he wore goggles and overalls, and the machine was smashed, though not so completely. Neither of the men had been identified. In the first case, there might be a reason for this, as the man was a foreigner. In the second case, the man was an Englishman. Both the machines were old patterns, and of a cheap make, carried fictitious numbers, and Baines had been unable to find out where they had been purchased. He held to his theory of the car, but was now inclined to think that the cyclist had been purposely driven into. Granted a certain shape of bonnet, and the car driven through Aylesbury appeared to have this shape. He contended that, in endeavoring to avoid the collision, a cyclist would be struck in exactly the manner indicated by the appearance of the head. He was therefore busy trying to trace a devil-mad motorist. The discovery of a dead chauffeur on a lonely road near Newbury now brought me into the affair. He had apparently been killed in precisely the same manner as the victims of the Aylesbury and Saffron Walden tragedies, and so I was brought in contact with Baines. From the first he scorned my arguments and suggestions. It seemed to me that this third tragedy went to disprove his theory of a madly driven motor car, but he insisted that it was only a further proof. Was it not possible, he asked, that the mad owner of the car, believing that his chauffeur knew the truth, had killed him to protect himself? I asked him how he supposed the car had been driven at the chauffeur in order to injure him, exactly as it had injured men on cycles. When Baines answered that the chauffeur was probably on a cycle at the time, I wanted to know why, in this case, the motorist had gathered up the broken machine and taken it away. In short, we quarreled over the affair, and Baines was furious when I was able to prove that in neither case was the wrecked cycle a complete machine. True, in one case, only some trivial pieces were missing, which might have been driven into the ground by the force of the fall, but in the other an important part was wanting, without which the machine could not have been driven. I came to the conclusion that there had been foul play, that the broken machines were blind, and that the men had been brought to the places where they were found after they were dead. I returned to London to pursue inquiries in this direction, and found a letter from Quarles asking me to go and see him as soon as possible. I went to Chelsea that evening, and was shown into the dining room. The professor looked a little old tonight, I thought. Very glad to see you, Wigan. I want your help. I shall be delighted to give it. You have helped me so often. Your granddaughter is well, I trust? Yes, she is away. She has taken a situation. A situation? I exclaimed. The world hasn't much use for a professor of philosophy in these days, and that leads to financial difficulty for the professor, Quarles answered. You glance round at the luxury of this room, I notice, and I can guess your thoughts. Selfish old brute, you are saying to yourself. But it was the child's wish, and we bide our time. 
she has made much of where she is i think it is my loneliness which deserves most pity besides there is no disgrace in honest work either for man or woman something of a challenge was in his tone and i hastened to agree with him in a sense the information was not unpleasant to me life was not to be all luxury for zena quarles the social standing of a detective however successful he may be is not very high and the necessity for her to work seemed to bring us nearer together the value of what i could offer her was increased and a spirit of hopefulness took possession of me but i didn't ask you here to pity either zena or myself quarles went on after a pause i dare say you have heard of mrs barrymore i have she advertised for a private secretary and zena answered the advertisement when a woman goes deeply into philanthropic work visits hospitals rescue homes and the like she often does it to fill a life which would otherwise be empty not to mrs barrymore she is a society woman as well is meant to be here there and everywhere she is a golfer a yachtswoman fond of sport generally and withal a charming hostess it is no wonder she wants a secretary you don't suppose i should let zena go anywhere to be treated as a kind of housemaid and in a way that no self-respecting servant would stand of course not i gather that you know mrs barrymore personally i saw her once or twice when she was a child i knew her mother i looked up quickly struck by his tone there is romance in every life wigan here you touch mine mrs barrymore's mother married an american she chose him rather than me and although i afterwards married i have never forgotten her naturally i feel an interest in her daughter mrs barrymore and i want your help in what way i want your opinion of her but i don't know her you must get to know her she puzzles me and certain things which zena has told me make me think i might help her i should like to do so if i can we have been useful to each other wigan because our methods are different i have formed a certain opinion of mrs barrymore the result of theorizing i shall not tell you what it is because i want your unbiased view arrived at by your method of going to work there is a mystery about her then my dear wigan that is exactly what i want to find out how am i to make her acquaintance i asked not as murray wigan certainly he said and then he added after a pause would you mind pretending to be zena's lover when i saw her a few days ago i said i would suggest this way to her mind pretend the professor knew little how the proposal pleased me he was offering me a part i could play to perfection it is a good idea was all i said we even thought of a name for you george hastings and you are a surveyor being in richmond you thought you might venture to call not having seen zena for some time mrs barrymore lives at lantern house richmond if you see mrs barrymore as i hope you will and make yourself agreeable she may give you permission to come again i think it will work all right will tomorrow be too soon to go i asked no if i am given the chance i will certainly go again when i can unfortunately i am very busy just now ah i haven't asked you about your work anything interesting one case or rather three cases in one and i told him about the cyclist and the chauffeur only wounds in the head what kind of wounds he asked i did not see the cyclist i can only speak of the chauffeur from direct knowledge the forehead just by the margin of the hair was bruised and the skin slightly abraded at the base of the head behind under the hair there was another bruise round the size of half a crown there was no swelling no blood i am told that the cyclists were also bruised about the temples what had the doctor to say very little in the chauffeur's case some severe blow had been delivered but he could not say how he was puzzled when i suggested the man might have been run down by a car quoting baines's idea he said it was a possible explanation he said so i fancy merely because he had no other suggestion to offer and the man's face wigan if a man could see death in some horrible shape and his features become suddenly fixed with terror he might look like the chauffeur did i answered he has not been identified either not yet but i'm hoping to trace him have you thought of one point wigan said quarles with some eagerness he may not have been a chauffeur nor the others cyclist they may only have worn the clothes it is possible i returned his hands had done manual work but not of an arduous kind there were curious marks on the body a discoloration under the arms and the skin somewhat chafed also on the outer side of the arms there were marks just above the elbows 
depressions rather than discolorations. A rope bound round the body might have produced the latter. There would have been marks upon the chest and back as well, said Quarles. I do not say it was a rope, I returned. Have you any helpful theory, Professor? For a few moments he had seemed keen. I should not have been surprised had he suggested our going to the empty room. Now he became apathetic, loose-minded, a man incapable of concentration. I had never known Quarles quite like this before. I will think of it. When I read the accounts in the papers, I thought I should like to assist you, he said slowly. But it is impossible tonight. Zena is not here. I am an incomplete machine without her. You must have realized that, Wigan, by this time. I have intimated before that the empty room, the listening for inspiration, and Quarles's faith in Zena's questions did not impress me very much. His excuse now I took as an intimation that he wanted to be alone. I will call at Mrs. Barrymore's tomorrow, I said as I rose to go. That's right, Manor House, Richmond. And by the way, Mr. Hastings, that is your name, remember, my granddaughter does not call herself Zena Quarles, but Mary Corbett. I have an old friend, Mrs. Corbett, and she has lent her name and her address for letters. Mrs. Barrymore may have heard of me from her mother, and mine is not a name easily forgotten. Besides, I understand. You would help Mrs. Barrymore without her knowing it. There may be another reason one does not advertise his financial difficulties if he can help it. Professor, we are friends, I said, with some hesitation. If you want... No, no, he answered quickly. I do not want to borrow yet. Thank you all the same, Wigan. Good night, and don't forget you are in love with Mary Corbett. On the following afternoon I went to Richmond, having supplied myself with some surveying instruments to support the part I was to play. This was unnecessary, perhaps, but I like to be on the safe side. I was excited. I was in love. There was no pretense about it, and if I could contrive to let Zena see the reality through the pretense, so much the better. Lantern House, which had grounds running down to the river, was large, rambling, and parts of it were very old, contemporaneous with the old palace of Richmond, it was said. A small cupola in the center portion of the building, possibly once used for stargazing, may have suggested the name. Zena evidently expected me, for the servant, without making any inquiry, showed me into a room opening onto the gardens at the back. Zena rose hastily from a writing table and hurried to meet me. George, she exclaimed. I caught both her outstretched hands in mine. Dearest, she turned quickly, a color in her cheeks, and then I saw we were not alone. A lady had risen from a chair at the end of the room and came forward. This is George Hastings, Mrs. Barrymore, Zena said. Well, Mr. Hastings, you may kiss her if you like. I shall not be shocked. And she laughed good-humoredly. Mary told me that you might come, and I am interested in the man she honors. So many girls make fools of themselves, and marry worthless specimens. Outwardly, I see nothing to take exception to in you, your character. I think Mary is satisfied, I said. So it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks, eh? I laughed a little awkwardly, playing my part well, I fancy, and showing just sufficient anxiety to impress Mrs. Barrymore favorably. She was a very handsome woman, tall, athletic, and evidently addicted to sport. Yet there was nothing ungraceful about her. Her manner was gracious and attractive. Her dress was charming. It was a marvel she had succeeded in remaining a widow. I will leave you, she said presently, but I can only spare Mary for a very short time today. You know, my dear, how busy we are with the appeal for that rescue society. Don't look so disappointed, Mr. Hastings. You may come tomorrow and have tea with Mary. Thank you so much. But remember only a few minutes today. As she went out of the room, Zena gave me a warning look. I was evidently to play my part even when Mrs. Barrymore was not there. Was there any harm in my coming, Mary? I asked. No, dear. Mrs. Barrymore is very kind to me. George, you haven't kissed me yet. She was afraid that curious eyes might be upon us, and felt that the parts we had assumed must be played thoroughly. I think the color deepened in my own cheeks as I bent down and touched her forehead with my lips. I know hers did. For me it was a lover's kiss, the first I had ever given. There is danger, but I'm not sure what it is, she whispered, as we stood close together. And then, drawing me to a chair, she said aloud, Tell me all you have been doing, George. I concocted a story of my surveying work, and managed to be the lover, too. If we had an audience, I fancied the deception was complete. We were not left long together. Mrs. Barrymore came back with an apology, and I departed, 
thinking a great deal more about Zena than of any mystery that might be about her employer. Yet from thinking of her, I began to fear for her. What danger could there be at Lantern House? There was some mystery. The professor had said as much, but surely he would not let his granddaughter run any risk. Still, there was danger enough for Zena to take precaution that our deception should not be discovered, even to the extent of allowing me to kiss her. I passed a restless night, and was in Richmond next day, long before it was possible for me to go to the house. When I did go, I was at least an hour before my time. I was shown into the same room as on the previous day. Mrs. Barrymore was there alone. "'You are early,' she said with a smile. "'Lovers are ever impatient. Did you meet Mary?' "'No. Is she out?' "'Oh, you need not go. She will be back to tea, and I am not sorry to have a quiet talk with you, Mr. Hastings. I am interested in Mary Corbett. She is nearly alone in the world, and my sympathy goes out to such women. I have worked a great deal for societies, dealing with women's status and employment.' and am most anxious to see a revision of the laws, which at present press too heavily on my sex. Come, tell me all about yourself, your present position, your prospects, everything. The story I told her would not have done discredit to a weaver of romance, and she was so sympathetic a listener that I felt a little ashamed of myself for practicing such deception. I think I am satisfied, she said at last, and I judge you have a soul above the mere commercial side of a surveyor's business, that the beautiful has an appeal to you. Do you know anything about this house? I believe part of it is old, I said. Very old, she returned. I like modern comforts, but I love the old things, too. We have a few minutes before tea and Mary's return. I will show you the old part of Lantern House, if you like. I have tried to give the rooms their original appearance, and am rather proud of my achievement. She was giving me an opportunity, which I could hardly have expected, a chance of seeing something which would give me a clue to the mystery concerning her. I might have known better what to look for if only the professor had been more explicit. Talking pleasantly, calling my attention to a view from a window, or to some unique piece of furniture, Mrs. Barrymore led me through several rooms, the contents of which told of the wealth and taste of the mistress of the house. I only use the old rooms on great occasions, she said, as we passed from a small boudoir into a dim passage. I have thought of letting the public see them on certain days, on payment of a small fee for the benefit of some charity, but I have not quite made up my mind. It would cut into my privacy a little, and in some ways I am selfish. There are two steps down, Mr. Hastings. She had opened a door and preceded me into a room. Tudor in its construction, Tudor in its contents, at least I suppose the contents were all in keeping, but I had not sufficient knowledge to be quite definite upon the point. The effect, if somewhat stiff and severe, was pleasing. A Philistine friend of mine complains of the somberness, said Mrs. Barrymore and wants me to have the electric light here, as it is in the rest of the house. Fancy Henry the Eighth wooing his many wives under the electric light. Why, they would almost have seen what a villain he was. Sit down for a moment, Mr. Hastings, and imagine yourself back across the centuries. It was just such a chair as that, which the fat king used when he talked statecraft or divorce with Wolsey. She seated herself by the table, and I took the chair she indicated. Never did blind man walk into a pit more unsuspectingly. The seat gave under me half a dozen inches, perhaps, setting the hidden mechanism to quick work. My ankles were gripped, the arms closed across me, pinning me securely just above the elbows, and a bar shot under my chin, holding my head rigidly against the back of the chair. Mrs. Barrymore got up quickly, went behind me, and in a moment had passed a cloth of some thick material over my mouth. Then she came and stood in front of me. Caught, she said. That chair holds you helpless and speechless. I know just how you feel. I'm going to tell you why. I dare say you know I am an American, at least my father was, although my mother was English. I married an Englishman, who was a genius, a crank, and a devil. We lived in the States, where you know electrocution is the death penalty, and my husband, a genius in all that had to do with electricity, invented an improved method, using little current, and dangerous in one particular. It is impossible to tell how the victim has died. He was so pleased with his invention, he would not make it public. He used it chiefly to terrify me. I was rich, my money was my own, and to get money from me, he has forced me into that chair, also an invention of his, and sworn he would kill me. Mine was a life of torture and terror. Then I played the siren with him. I asked him to explain his devilish machine to me, and vowed to make him over a large sum of money in exchange for the secret. He agreed, the fool. I kept my promise and paid the money, but one night when he was drunk I pushed him into that chair. He was the first victim of his own invention, and to this day his death remains a mystery. She laughed very quietly, 
not like a mad woman, and going to a corner of the room, she opened a panel near the floor and brought out a curious contrivance, circular in shape, but not a complete circle, something like a metal cap with a triangular piece missing at the back. Wires were attached to it and were also secured within the cupboard. They uncoiled as she came across the room, carrying the metal cap in her hand. My husband was the type of brute who loves to torture women in some form or other, she said. There are thousands of such men, especially in England, I think, or why are societies so necessary to protect women, to help them, to relieve them? Such devils are better out of the world, and I had the power to be something more than a philanthropist. I had the knowledge and the money to be an active agent. I came to England. I hate Englishmen because of my husband, and I have made a beginning. It was easy among my charitable concerns to hear of men who were brutes and who would not be missed. In such a man I took an interest, was kind to him, brought him here to Lantern House to befriend him. He has sat in that chair as you are sitting. He has worn this cap as you wear it. How to get rid of him afterward? Underneath us is a basement where I have a car ready, a car I drive myself, and of the existence of which nobody knows. An old house was an advantage to me, you see. It is easy to put goggles and overalls on a dead man. To contrive an iron frame which should keep him in a sitting position was not difficult, and you are exactly over a trap through which you can be lowered into the car. Then a drive in the night, when I am dressed like a man, and have a companion with me who sits upright beside me. Then an unfrequent piece of country, and I come home again, alone. Twice cyclists have been found, one of them a foreigner, their broken machines beside them. It was easy to buy a fifth-rate motor machine, smash it, and carry it in the car. The cycle confused investigation, and I was secured from detection. Then a chauffeur was found. I did not take so much trouble with him, and I wondered how his death would be explained. She laughed again. You may say you are not one of these brutes. Perhaps not. But do you remember the day Lord Deltmouth married Lady Evelyn Marling? Such a wealth of wedding presents required careful watching, and a guest was pointed out to me as Murray Wigan, the great detective. I never forget a face, and I never underrate an enemy. I heard that Murray Wigan was inquiring into the mysterious death of the chauffeur. I knew you for the moment you came into the house. Who the girl is, I do not care. Your accomplice has nothing to fear. I do not war against women. I sent her to London. When she returns, she will learn that you have been and gone. You will be found, Murray Wigan, sixty or seventy miles from London and since death by this method draws the features strangely. It is doubtful if you will be identified. You were clever to get upon my track, but you pay the penalty. The perspiration stood out heavily upon me. Fear gripped me, and I was helpless. Yet even in this supreme moment, even when this fiend of a woman fitted that horrible metal cap upon my head, I remembered the marks upon the dead chauffeur. He had been electrocuted as I was to be. It was the frame holding him in a sitting posture, which had marked his body. It was this awful chair which had left those depressions on his arms. I was glad to know the truth. It was the ruling passion, strong in death. The woman crossed to the cupboard quickly. There was a click, the moving of the switch, and then... nothing. Thank God, nothing. The cap gripped my head, that was all. The woman looked at me, and then rushed to the door, only to stagger backwards as Christopher Qualls and Zena met her on the threshold. Their first thought was for me, and Mrs. Barrymore had the moment for which she had always been prepared, doubtless. The poison pillule had been concealed in the signet ring she wore, and in a few moments she was lying dead in that horrible Tudor room. Then Mrs. Barrymore had invited me to come to tea on the following day, when there was no reason why I should not have stayed then, had aroused Zena's suspicions, and she had watched Mrs. Barrymore's every movement. Until then she knew nothing of the secret of the Tudor room, but she saw her employer go there and examine the cupboard. In the night, Zena went and examined it, and destroyed the current by rendering the switch ineffective. Every day since Zena had been at Lantern House, Quarles had met her in the grounds. Of course, she had not gone to London that day, but had met her grandfather, and they had entered the house together, unseen. It would have been in time to prevent my going through that horrible ordeal had I not arrived an hour before I was expected. You had no right to let Zena run such a risk, I said to Quarles. You ought not have sent her to Lanner House to test your theories. She ran no risk, was his answer. It was only against man, Mrs. Barrymore fought. I am sorry you had such an experience, Wigan. I never supposed she would attempt your life, did not imagine she would know who you were. Indeed, I was doubtful of my theory altogether. 
when the first cyclist was found i suspected electrocution in some form and the other two cases went to confirm the suspicion i knew something of barrymore a hateful brute but a genius and i knew his wonderful knowledge of electricity his death must have been a relief to his wife and the manner of it may be suspicious of her he was found on a lonely road miles away from his home in washington and no one could tell how he died was it remarkable i should wonder if mrs barrymore were responsible for the crimes here and i would have saved her if i could for the sake of her mother if i could have done that wigan you would have got no theory out of me in this case and your friend baines might have gone on hunting for his mad motorist for the rest of his days so i had touched the professor's romance and now had one of my own i had pretended to be a lover and i had found a moment to tell zena that it was no pretense with me the color deepened in her cheeks as it had done when i kissed her and she did not stop my confession my grandfather he can still remain with us i said eagerly seeing no difficulties say yes zena it must not be yet but some day perhaps some day and i was content 